Welcome to Terrifying Tales, the channel dedicated to bringing you original horror stories. Apocalypse of the Wolf, Chapter 1 I know not with what weapons World War 3 will be fought, but World War 4 will be fought with sticks and stones. Albert Einstein The wind whipped at Dana Sterling's face as she gripped the reins of her horse. Her white cloak trailed behind like a sail caught in the breeze. Dana was one of eight riders on this mission, part of the 14th Reaver Regiment, 2nd Platoon. The 1st Platoon was overdue. A mother and her children arrived at Elmwood from the farming village of Rainwell just before sunrise. Rainwell had been attacked. The mother and children were terrified. They made no sense. What little they did relay was concerning. The walls of Rainwell had held for years. There were instances of minor attacks, but nothing ever big enough to take out an entire village. Commander of the Reavers, John Hunter, sent his best to investigate. The entire 1st Platoon, led by Ada Sawano, Rainwell was an hour's ride from Elmwood. When nightfall came with no word from the first, John asked for a handful of volunteers from the second to investigate. Dana gritted her teeth as she eyed her brother Roy, riding beside her. He was the reason she was riding in the dark. When the call for volunteers came, Roy was the first to raise his hand. Dana had no choice. The promise she made to their father echoed through her mind. Her eyes drifted to the crescent moon in the sky, blood red against the black backdrop. Dana slowed her horse to pace with Captain Hoover's. The village is just ahead in the clearing. He jumped to the ground and unsheathed his blade. We'll fan out and head in on foot, use the tree line as cover. Dana clutched Roy's arm. Stay where I can see you. I'll be fine, he shrugged her off. The reavers broke and circled the high timber walls of Rainwell. In pairs, they entered through the four open gates. The village was too quiet. Even this late in the evening, there should have been signs of life. Candlelight creeping around shuttered windows, horses settling, the odd drunken shout of merriment. Something was off. Vulnerability swept through Dana as she passed by the high timber walls. The white cloaks broke from the gates, even distance apart. They all converged in the centre of Rainwell. Where is everybody? Connors asked. Even in the darkness, Dana could see the fear in his eyes as the words left his mouth. I mean, shouldn't our guys be here, Captain? Hmm. It wasn't like Hoover to be unsure. Fan out and go door to door. Report back to me if you find anything. Dana and the others started to move. Watch each other's backs. What are you doing? Roy noticed Dana beside him. This will go a lot quicker if we split up. No chance, Dana replied. You're staying where I can see you. Like an earthquake, the ground throughout the village shook. They tore free from the dirt and launched into the air. Ambush! Hoover called. The team drew their weapons, heavily outnumbered, but they were the best. Glowing eyes focused on the young warriors from every direction. Dana pressed her fingers around the leather grip of her silver chain whip. Her breath held as she scanned the rooftops. She let it out when she saw only white eyes. We may make it out of this yet. Stay with me. Roy gave his sister a nod and pulled the pair of curved blades from his belt. The stalemate ended with a snarl as the first wolf leapt from the rooftop, claws extended, arms pulled back. The wolf stopped dead as the whip wrapped around its throat and crumpled to the ground. Dana retracted the whip, tearing the wolf's head from its body. A collective howl rose around Rainwell.
Here we go, Hoover cried. The wolves moved as one as they launched at the eight. The air filled with the sound of steel and claws. Roy slid across the ground, slashed forward. Blood covered his white cloak as the two wolves dropped dead behind him. There's too many, someone cried, followed by a guttural scream of agony. Hoover ducked as the slash passed over his head. His sword flashed and the wolf fell dead beside him. Drop back to the well. Dana's whip wrapped around a clawed foot. She pulled back, tearing the foot clean off. The wolf fell forward. The sound of splintered bone followed as its head exploded beneath Dana's boot. She turned at the weight on her shoulder, stopping her fist short of Roy's face. Come on, Hoover wants us at the well. Roy's ragged breath filled Dana's ears as they sprinted for the well. They ducked and slid without breaking stride as countless claws scratched and slashed. Hoover was by the well with two others. Keep the well at your back. They can't get behind us. These fuckers don't stand a chance. Dana's heart sank in her chest as the sound reverberated from the walls of the well. Alpha! The towering black wolf emerged from the well, eyes red as fire. It charged toward Dana. Roy knocked her out of the way. No! The claws of the alpha tore through Roy's stomach and chest. He dropped to his knees. His eyes found his sister. Roy tried to speak, but only blood came out. He fell face first, lifeless into the dirt. Dana charged forward. The alpha swatted her away like a fly. Her head crashed into the stone of the well. She remained conscious long enough to see the alpha tear Hoover's head from his shoulders and the two remaining white cloaks disappear through the wooden gate toward the tree line. As darkness closed in, Dana's eyes fell on her brother's body, and her ears filled with the blood-curdling call of the Alpha. This was a sound Dana had heard before. As the air filled with the sound of thunderous footsteps, her mind grasped at the memory from a different time, and a promise that was made. Warmth of the sun's rays drifted through the open shutters of the window. Roy pulled the quilt over his head in a futile attempt to ward off the day. Come on, it's time to get up. Dana's tiny fingers tugged at Roy's quilt. He groaned beneath. Just a few more minutes. No, father is waiting. With a final tug, Dana ripped the quilt to the floor, revealing her younger brother. Wonder filled her. Roy was nine, but could pass for a boy of five. She didn't understand. Roy was well fed but his body refused to put on any weight. Hurry it up, their father called from below. Fine, Roy groaned, stretching his arms above his head. The pair hurried downstairs to their father. Can I grab something to eat first? Roy asked. Max smiled at his son, unsurprised. Take it on the go. Roy grabbed a sweetbread. It was gone before the front door of the cottage opened. The village was already buzzing. Kids were playing. Horse-drawn carriages rolled by, carting things for trade. Dana hid her jealousy. She longed for the freedom enjoyed by the other village children. The decision to hide her jealousy was not one made by pride. Her father did his best to raise her and Roy. With their mother dead, it was a battle to keep them living. A task their father wouldn't be able to perform as she and Roy didn't do their part. The final war, or as the adults called it, World War III, ended before she was born. Her father didn't speak about it much. What Dana learned was that the world used to be a different place. Her father, sometimes if she were lucky, would speak of computers that held all manner of answers to questions right in people's pockets. Or he would reminisce about stories he called movies that played on electric screens for enjoyment, of things called cars and planes that carried people long distances by road or air with no need for days of planning to travel or animals to move them. The war was the reason these things no longer existed. Their father was not a person who drank, except for one night. On that night, Dana learned all she thought she would about the final war. Her father spoke of people drunk on power and an eagerness to control the entire world. Great countries fought against others for control of land, or more importantly, what the ground held. Father told us some of those in power lacked compassion and reasoning, and the others failed to identify the danger. In the blink of an eye, the world crumbled. 
Armies prove useless once the tempers of a certain few individuals frayed. Many predicted the world would end at the press of buttons and nuclear war. They were wrong. Man-made plagues crippled humanity. Chemical war carried on the wind. Sickness spread, killing millions upon millions. Infrastructure collapsed with no one left to run it. Generational knowledge destroyed. In final acts of desperation, that's when the nukes launched. Not a major city remained untouched. Dana understood that it all could have ended at that point. Nuclear winter, her father had called it. But through pure luck, a few small areas somehow remained untouched. Entire histories were destroyed in the devastation. Only 1% of the population survived, and nobody over the age of 13 lived. No one knew why, but those under the age of 13 were immune to the sickness. But there was no one left capable of rebuilding what was gone. Father called it travelling back in time. Dana thought often of her father's story, and of how lucky she was to be alive, seeing as her parents had been part of the 1%. She couldn't remember her mother. Dana was two years old when she passed. She died giving birth to Roy. Her father missed her. Poppy was her name. Dana often caught her father speaking to her when he thought he was alone. Can we have the day off? Roy asked. Max laughed. I'll make you a deal. Once we're done with the horses, you two can go and play and I'll do the rest. Roy's face beamed. Let's hurry. We can go for a swim in the river, Dana. Huh? Dana, lost in thought, hadn't been paying attention. We can go for a swim when we're done with the horses. Oh. Okay. Gee, don't get too excited, Max chuckled. The water of the river was cool to the touch as Dana dipped her feet. Roy's laughter carried across the riverbed as he splashed. River Douglas was one of the last remaining fresh water sources in the world. The river provided water to many villages, from their own small nameless one to Rainwell, Elmwood and all the way to the capital of Riverwall. Many children from the village had the same idea as Roy to escape the heat. Dana noticed some other girls giggling in her direction. She felt a flush in her cheeks as her eyes dropped to her tattered brown skirt and back to their nice summer dresses. Dana's heart skipped a beat. Screams carried from the village close by. The girls giggling stopped. They screamed as the monsters rushed toward the riverbed. Dana sat motionless, eyes wide. Her father had described wolves to her before. These creatures reminded her of that description. Black fur, large claws, long snouts filled with sharp teeth. But it couldn't be. The wolves described by her father were no bigger than a large dog and walked on four legs. These were bigger than any man and stood on two legs. The giggling girl's screams were high-pitched as claws painted their pretty summer dresses red. Come on, Dana! Roy tugged at his sister's sleeve. We need to get help! Dana grabbed her brother's arm and led him to the trees. What are those monsters? Roy cried as he ran. I don't know, Dana replied. We have to get to father. The village was unrecognisable as Dana and Roy broke through the tree line. The place was crawling with snarling monsters. People were being torn apart and eaten alive in the dirt. Trent Barkley put a pitchfork straight through the chest of one. Dana was close enough for the blood to spatter her skirt. Trent's eyes grew wide as the wolf stood tall. The beast slashed forward, opening Trent's face up. Dana let out a scream and led Roy around as the beast pounced on top of Trent. Kids! Max yelled as Dana and Roy entered the stables. I'm glad you're okay. What are they? Roy yelled. I don't know. Max replied, but we're getting out of here. Max already had a horse saddled. He picked up Roy and placed him in the saddle. Max lifted Dana up behind him. He set to work saddling a second horse. When we ride out of here, don't stop for anything. Dana was in shock. Max shook her. Did you hear what I said, Dana? She nodded. No matter what happens, always remember I love you both. If I don't make it out, promise me, Dana. Promise me you'll protect Roy no matter what. Dana kept silent. Promise me, Dana. Say the words. 
I promise. The ceiling of the stable exploded. Three wolves dropped into the hay-covered floor. Go! Max screamed. He smacked the rear of the horse and sent it on its way. Dad! Roy screamed as they rode from the stable. Their father's scream carried over the chaos around them as they made their way for the tree line. Wolves slashed and snarled at the horse. The horse required no rider to lead. It weaved and jumped from harm's way as the children held on for dear life. Dana turned back to see a wolf larger than the others at the centre of the village. Deep red eyes of fire. Dana came to with the memory fresh in her mind. The sun was rising in the distance. Where am I? It fluttered back. Roy. She crawled from the well to her brother's still body. Her worst fears confirmed as she rolled him over. A man grown, Dana still saw the same tiny boy she'd seen clutching his quilt that summer's morning. She understood she'd failed to keep her father's promise. They're heading for Elmwood. A tear rolled down her cheek. The salt taste touched her lip. Your death will be avenged, brother. Dana coiled her silver chain whip to her belt and sprinted for the gate. Chapter 2 There is a price you pay if you want to train military personnel. They don't all come back. Dan John Over the sound of her boots, Dana heard the groan of the barn door. Just keep going. She'd made it to the exit gate. The tree line leading back to Elmwood was right there. Something told her to wait. Dana stared into the darkness of the barn through the gap offered by the door. The wolves were just as active during daylight hours as they were at night. If it was a wolf, it would have already rushed her. This was either the breeze or something else. Dana's fingers gripped the splintered wood of the barn door. They nestled gently into the grooves created by a wolf's slash. The door opened easily enough. Rays from the rising sun filtered onto the hay-covered floor. The horse gently trotted over to her with obvious excitement. Hey there. Dana stroked the horse's neck. How did you make it through the attack unscathed? The gentle rustle carried to Dana's ears from the darkened corner of the barn. Sunlight reflected off the silver blade as she pulled the dagger from her belt. You stay right here, she whispered gently to the horse. Dana circled the barn toward the corner. The trail of blood was fresh. Two pairs of terrified eyes stared up at her, cuddled up to the burly body of a man. Hi, Dana whispered. She took a knee and slid the knife back into her belt. It's okay, I'm not going to hurt you. The children couldn't have been any older than seven. A boy and a girl. Noting the pair's tattered clothing, Dana couldn't help but be reminded of herself and Roy at that age. Come on, we need to leave. The boy moved first. The girl buried her face in the chest of the body of the burly man. What's your name? Dana asked. I'm Henry, the boy said, and this is my sister Susan. Well, Henry and Susan, my name's Dana. Come on, Susan, Henry said. No, Susan replied, not without father. Dana knew there was nothing she could say to the children about their father to make it any better. Her eyes drifted to the wooden cart resting beside them. A plan formed in her mind. Do you think you could help me, Susan? The girl wiped the tears from her eyes. Okay. I'm terrible with horses. Do you think you could hook this cart up to the horse for me? His name is Maximus, Susan said. That's a lovely name for a horse, Dana replied. Did you name him yourself? Susan nodded and picked herself up from the ground. Henry helped her drag the cart toward the horse. Dana's attention turned to the body of the children's father. He was missing his right arm. Apart from that, He was relatively unscathed. 
Her heart jumped as the man let out a gentle groan. Uh-oh. If he was still alive this long after the attack, that can only mean one thing. Finished, Henry called. Dana kept her tone even. That's great. Well done. Do you think you two could lead Maximus out to the village well for me? The pair nodded and walked the horse out of the barn. It was a gamble to send them out unprotected, but not as big as leaving them in the barn right now. Once they disappeared from sight, Dana knelt down beside their father. She pulled the knife back out from her belt. Please, the man breathed. Get Henry and Susan somewhere safe for me. Tears welled in Dana's eyes. This man was not only still alive, but he also hadn't turned. The blade trembled in a hand above his chest. I will. Promise me, the man breathed. I promise. Dana hesitated. Her own father's face flashed through her mind. She forced her eyes closed and plunged the knife down. The last air escaped the man's lips. Dana cleaned the blade and left the barn. She found Henry and Susan waiting patiently by the well with the horse. Dana lifted Henry onto the horse and lifted Susan up behind. Now that she'd found the means, she wasn't going to let Roy rot on the ground. Dana struggled with her brother's body as she lifted it to rest on the back of the cart. She wiped the sweat from her brow. I think it's time we left, don't you? Can we bring father's body too? Henry asked. Susan began sobbing. Before Dana could respond, the roar echoed from the barn. Father! Henry cried. Susan screamed as their father emerged from the barn and dropped to the dirt. His body convulsed as claws erupted from his boots and hand. As fur sprouted from his body, a new right arm tore free from the stump, punctuated by claws. The white eyes locked onto Dana as the wolf's snout tore free from the man's jaw. The wolf covered half the distance between the barn and the well in a single leap. With a snarl, it sprinted toward them. Dana realised her mistake. With her eyes closed, her knife strike hadn't been fatal. Dana sprinted forward to meet the wolf. She uncoiled her silver chain whip from her belt. Susan screamed as she fell from the horse. The wolf stopped short, its eyes darting between Susan and Dana. Susan, don't move! The wolf made its decision. It charged toward the terrified child. Dana cut the angle and sprinted towards Susan. A cloud of dirt kicked as Dana slid across the ground and cradled Susan in her arms. She turned to see the wolf hurtling through the air toward them. Whistling cut through the air as the silver-tipped arrows cannoned into the wolf's chest. It slammed into the dirt, its momentum gone. Steel sang as the wolf's head rolled away from its body toward the well. Trying to get yourself killed, Dana? Sebastian asked. He slid his sword back into its sheath. A snarl of disdain covered his face. Are you okay? Petra yelled, jumping down from the rooftop of a nearby building, clutching her bow. Marco, Thomas and Isabel quickly followed. Petra launched at Dana before she could answer in a suffocating embrace, her blonde hair catching in Dana's open mouth. Jeez, Petra, let her breathe, will you? Isabel muttered. Sorry. Petra said, her cheeks flushed as she stepped back from Dana. Dana picked up the sobbing Susan from the dirt and set her back behind her brother on the horse. Picking up strays almost cost you your life, Sebastian muttered. Where's the rest of second? I'm it. Sebastian shook his head. It's just fantastic. How many did they send? Dana's brow furrowed. Eight. Then you did well, Thomas said. We were a hundred, and that horde killed ninety-five of us. Dana took the group in properly for the first time. 
Sebastian always looked like someone had just taken a shit in his food. But the others, their confidence was gone, replaced with looks of defeat. We didn't stand a chance, Marco whispered. It wasn't like it usually is. The wolves were organised. We walked right into a trap. Before we knew it, we were... They had an alpha, Dana said. The others all answered to it. I'm sure that's the only reason they didn't finish me off when it knocked me out. An alpha, Isabel breathed. We've all heard the stories, but there's never been a confirmed. Isabel let the sentence hang. She'd been one of the most vocal to ridicule Dana's childhood story of the alpha when they all went through recruit training. Where were they heading? Sebastian asked. Or are you useless? His cold eyes always lacked compassion. They're heading for Elmwood, Dana replied. A smirk crossed Sebastian's lips. You're telling me those mindless beasts are suddenly launching a military campaign against us? Really, Sebastian? Petra snarled. You saw with your own eyes what they did to our entire platoon in a matter of minutes. Her hands dropped to her hips. We'd be dead too if we hadn't run away. Save it, Petra, Sebastian snarled. His eyes dropped to the dirt. So that's it, isn't it, Dana thought. You're always an arsehole. But leaving the rest of the platoon to die doesn't sit right with you. Sebastian eyed the wagon. We should ditch it if you're right, Dana. It's only going to slow us down. No, Dana snapped. I'm not leaving him here to rot. All eyes fell on the back of the wagon. Dana pulled the white cloak back to reveal the blood-streaked face of a brother. Dana studied the faces of the others. Even Sebastian softened. Dana never liked Sebastian. But after a rocky start during recruit training, Roy and Sebastian grew to respect each other. I suppose you're right, Dana. On foot, the wagon isn't going to slow us down much. Sebastian made his way toward the rain well out of gate. What are you all waiting for? Let's get moving. If Dana's right, they're going to need every man and woman they can get at Elmwood. The forest gave way to the fields as the sun began its descent for the day. The small band of reavers were quiet, the travel on foot taking the majority of their energy. Dana's eyes studied the faces of the others. Petra, Thomas, Marco and Isabel looked like they were ready to drop. Don't worry about them. Sebastian whispered. They don't know how to quit. I'll make it. Henry and Susan were whispering to one another on the back of the horse. When I grow up, I'm going to become a reaver. I'll kill every wolf there is, Henry whispered. Sebastian chuckled. He reminds me of someone. Dana didn't need Sebastian to elaborate. The mess hall of the training facility at Riverwall was buzzing with the excited conversations of the recruits. Hey Roy, what are you going to choose at the end of the week? Thomas asked. The Reavers, Roy replied with a beaming smile. Sebastian seated at the next table laughed. The smile dropped from Roy's face. What's so funny? Why are you so eager to die, Barrett? Sebastian asked. Why not do the smart thing and join me on the interior guard? Because I'm not like you, Sebastian. I'm not a coward. It was Sebastian's turn to drop his smile. What good is a little shit like you going to do against the wolves? A lot more than a coward who hides in the capital. That was it. Roy and Sebastian were both on their feet, fists flying. Come on, guys, stop it, Marco cried, stepping between them. Sebastian's fist collected Marco's cheek and sent him flying across the floor. Should we stop them? Petra asked. Dana shook her head. With any luck, Roy wipes that smug look off Sebastian's face. The mess hall doors burst open. What the hell's going on in here? Commander Yuri boomed. His eyes fell on the bruised faces at the centre of the commotion. Roy Barrett and Sebastian Braun. Why am I not surprised? Blood dripped to the floor from Sebastian's lip. Well, seeing as you brats are full of energy, who am I to stop you? Grab your gear. You two can perform the graduation exercise right now. A collective gasp filled the mess hall. 
The last exercise involved pairs taking down a wolf. They always performed the last exercise during daylight under strict conditions. Enough wolves were captured and held. In pairs, the recruits were responsible for taking down the wolves released into an obstacle course. More than a few recruits made it this far into training only to die at the last hurdle. Sebastian and Roy stood frozen, eyes wide. Please explain what part of what I just said was unclear, gentlemen, Commander Yuri said. Both boys didn't speak. But they knew they shouldn't be doing this exercise at night. Dana gathered with the others on the stands overlooking the high walls of the obstacle course. Her heart thundered in her chest. She'd planned on pairing with Roy to keep him safe, as she had done the entire four years of their training. Dana felt powerless as her brother entered the course with Sebastian at his side. Both boys held the standard sword and shield made from silver. The familiar scream carried from the darkness at the other end of the course. Just stay out of my way and let me handle this, shit stain, Sebastian muttered. Roy snorted with derision, like I'm going to rely on an interior guard to get the job done against a wolf. Neither boy was willing to admit to the other how truly scared they were. If you're that eager to die, be my guest, Sebastian said, pointing toward the darkness. Roy crept forward, sword ready. Look out! Someone screamed above the walls. The wolf flew toward Roy. He reacted fast enough to lift his shield. The claw slashed against the metal echoing through the course. The force of the hit knocked Roy backwards. Air left his body as his back slammed into the dirt. The sword slipped from his fingertips. The wolf was on him before he could move. Metal crunched as Roy moved the shield desperately to block the blows from the wolf's slashes. The wolf knocked the shield clear. Roy's eyes widened as the claws came down. Sebastian's sword swung through the air. The wolf howled and backed away as its arm dropped to the ground beside Roy. Sebastian tripped backwards as the wolf turned its attention to him and charged. The wolf lunged at Sebastian. Roy clubbed the wolf's head with the shield, sending it careening into the wall. Sebastian accepted Roy's hand as he helped him from the ground. With a roar, Sebastian swung his sword with everything he had. The wolf's head dropped to the dirt. The course gate opened. Commander Yuri walked through. Not bad, boys. Not bad at all. You two may hate each other, but you just learned something no one else here has yet. Commander Yuri was met with confused looks. Hate each other or not, you both know when shit hits the fan, you can rely on one another. Done with the memory. Dana caught Sebastian staring at her. He looked away, a noticeable flush in his cheeks. Dana knew that night changed things between Sebastian and her brother. She would never presume to call them friends, but they never fought again. Sebastian didn't end up joining the interior guard. After that night, he joined the Reavers. Sebastian was an asshole, but Roy was the closest thing he had to a friend. Oh shit, Marco muttered. Dana's eyes drifted to the red glow on the horizon. We're too late. Elmwood was ablaze. The call of the Alpha echoed from behind the city walls. <laughs> Chapter 3 You must be stronger than the situation in order to conquer it. Layla Akita Only the horse dared move as Dana waited with the others for Sebastian and Petra to return. The night was cold. Mist escaped her lips with each breath as her eyes studied the darkness between the grassy hill they waited on and the glow of the flames behind the walls of Elmwood. Dana gripped the handle of her dagger as the dark shapes hurried toward them. Her fingers relaxed as she made out the faces of Sebastian and Petra. Ditching the white cloaks for the scouting mission was Thomas's idea. They all assumed the wolves had excellent night vision, but black leather had to be harder to spot than white cloaks. What did you see down there? Isabel asked. 
Sebastian turned to Petra before answering. Everyone left alive is taking a stand behind the inner wall. The town between the outer wall and inner is completely overrun. That bad, Marco whispered. Petra nodded. I think Dana's right. About what? Thomas asked. About the wolves being organised. Petra took a knee in the grass in front of the others. Sebastian and I were able to get pretty close to the inner wall without being spotted. Every wolf in Elmwood, and trust me, there's a lot, is trying to breach the inner wall. They're all working together. Hmm. Thomas's eyes drifted to Elmwood. Interesting. Exactly how close did you get? Within 50 metres, Sebastian said. Well, that settles it. There was a twinkle in Thomas's eye. Settles what? Isabel asked. That close, Thomas said. There's no way some of the wolves wouldn't have caught the scent of Sebastian and Petra. Yet none left the inner wall to search for them. They're on a mission. <laughs> Isabel snorted. I told you, you stink. Petra punched her in the arm. So what do we do? Dana asked. You seem like you have a plan. Thomas shook his head. Not really. I do. Sebastian whispered. Dana stifled laughter. Surprised to see the others didn't share her amusement. What's the look in their eyes? It's respect. What is it then, Captain? Petra asked. Sebastian's face twisted at the word Captain. Enough with the Captain stuff. He hesitated. I feel like a one-trick pony, but it's just a bigger version of what I did to get us out of Rainwall. Good enough for me, Marco whispered. Dana couldn't believe what she was hearing. The man everyone, save perhaps her brother, hated, was the one they all turned to. What happened at Rainwall? How does what you did at Rainwall transpire to here? Isabel asked. You charged like a madman into the wolves and told the rest of us to run for the gate. I didn't say it was a good plan, Sebastian said. But I had time to think about it on the walk back to you. The boats are in the harbour on the river by the eastern outer wall. Two of you will need to get them ready for boarding and take the two kids with you. Henry and Susan were exhausted. They slept in the grass beside them. That leaves four of us to make for the eastern gate of the inner wall. Hopefully there are horses left in the stables by the harbour. I don't like our chances, but they're even worse on foot. In pairs we try to lead as many wolves away from the inner eastern gate as possible. The two people at the harbour need to light the lanterns. Hopefully they see them behind the inner wall. How are we going to get the wolves away from the gate if they aren't interested in us? Marco asked. A good question, Sebastian replied. Something tells me if we get close enough and hack a few of them into pieces, at least some of them will fall into old habits. If it works and we have horses, we ride in pairs. One toward the northern outer wall, the other south. We follow the wall back toward the harbour gate in the east. Hopefully that leaves those left alive at the inner gate enough space and time to get as many people out as they can to the boats. Dana had to admit, for what they had and what they were dealing with, it was a pretty good plan. One other thing, Thomas said. All eyes fell on him. Whichever pair head to the harbour, be careful. If the wolves are organised, then they probably have contingencies in place. If we thought of it, they have too. There may be a few wolves lying in wait by the boats. Right, I'm in, Isabel said. Who's going where? The group traced the stone path along the eastern wall toward the harbour. Isabel's eyes drifted to the clear water of River Douglas on her right. Babysitting duty. Figures. Henry and Susan remained silent on the back of Maximus. The gentle squeak of the wheels of the cart carrying Roy's body bumped along. Thomas's eyes remained on the wall as he strode beside Isabel. It could be the most dangerous of all the jobs. Don't get complacent. Isabel rolled her eyes. Do you really think the wolves are smart enough to be waiting on the boats? We'll find out soon. The boats bobbed and jutted in the water just ahead of them. The sound of hooves from the eastern harbour stables echoed along. Well, the horses seem unbothered, Isabel said. 
She hadn't noticed Sebastian walk up beside her. Let's hope there are enough horses in there to make this plan work. Thomas set to work untying the boat ropes from the mooring posts. Isabel set the boarding platforms. They hit the stone path one at a time with a thud. After each, the group held their collective breath, waiting for the wolves to hear. They never did. Dana helped Henry and Susan with Maximus up the boarding platform of the nearest boat. She settled them inside and returned to the deck. I'll be back for this soon, little brother. Dana set her silver whip gently on Roy's chest. It was almost surreal how calm everything on the eastern shore was in comparison to the chaos erupting a few miles away at the inner wall. Even so, Dana felt eyes watching her. Sebastian, Marco and Petra were already a horse when Dana entered the stables. Saddled your horse, Barrett. Marco and Petra giggled. What's so funny? Marco and Petra exchanged glances and giggled again. Come on, out with it. Barrett, Petra said. Dana goes by Sterling. Huh? Sebastian flushed. What are you talking about? It's fine, Dana said. My name is Barrett. You're just the only one who calls me that. What? Dana took two short swords down from the armory wall of the stable. When Roy and I joined the recruits together, they don't let siblings serve in the same place. I signed up as Dana Sterling so I could stay with my brother. She sheathed the swords and attached them to her hip. Once we were well on our way, we stopped caring who knew. But everyone had known me for years by then, so they just kept calling me Sterling. She mounted a horse and trotted toward the others. I guess you never bothered to learn my name in the first few years you knew me. Sterling, huh? Sebastian smiled. I like that better than Barrett anyway. It was Dana's turn to blush. The four of them exited the stables. Isabel, give us a minute and then light the beacons along the harbour. Hopefully when we draw the wolves away from the gate, the survivors will have enough hints from behind the inner wall to make a break for the boats. Sebastian turned to Dana. Right then, Sterling. When we get to the inner eastern gate, you and Marco break for the northern gate. Petra and I will head south. Hopefully that gives the survivors in Elmwood enough time to get to the boats. We'll exit the outer gates and loop back around. Roger that, Captain, Petra said. Sebastian grimaced. Enough captain talk. But if you're taking orders, I only have one. Stay alive. If you die, it'll piss me off. The four rode for the inner eastern gate. Isabel counted out the minute in her head and lit the first beacon. She sprinted along the harbour with the torch lighting all the others. Isabel's blood ran cold. Thomas was aboard the boat with Henry and Susan. He heard the howl from inside. Wait in here. Thomas went out to the deck. (coughs) Pairs of white eyes stared down at him from the top of the outer wall. So they were waiting. He counted maybe ten sets of eyes. Their claws landed with a thud as they dropped from the wall to the stone path of the harbour. The wolves converged and crept toward the boat as Isabel sprinted along the dock. Come on, think. She made a beeline for the stables. What's going on? Henry asked. He stood wide-eyed by the open door of the boat's cabin. Get back inside. Protect your sister, Thomas yelled. The first wolf pounced onto the boat, knocking Thomas to the ground. His sword slipped from his grasp and tumbled along the deck. Isabel rode from the stables onto the harbour. Come and get me, you ugly bastards. Oh, shit. Isabel turned the horse and rode through the outer eastern gate into Elmwood. The wolves gave chase. All except one. Drool dripped onto Thomas's face. He held the wolves' claws at bay with his hands, but was powerless to prevent the descending jaws as they slowly inched toward his face. Henry swung the sword with everything he had. The steel cut through the wolf's back. It howled with pain and reared back. Thomas pulled the dagger from his boot and slid it beneath the wolf's jaw through its skull. 
that dropped lifelessly to the deck beside Thomas. Thank you, Henry. Thomas took the sword from the boy's trembling hands. Go back inside with your sister. He looked to the eastern gate to see Isabel riding off with the other wolves giving chase. The smoke from the fires burning throughout Elmwood was worse than expected. Still, Dana and the others charged forward. The inner wall should be coming up, Sebastian yelled. Dana heard him well enough, but barely made him out through the smoke. Dana's horse reared as they reached the inner wall abruptly. The horde was larger than any Dana had ever seen. The wolves were as surprised to see Dana as she was them. Sebastian drew his sword and slashed at the snarling horde. Come and get us! Sebastian's attempts to antagonise worked. The horde surrounding the inner eastern gate turned on the riders. Break now! Dana and Marco turned north and rode. Eyes of the interior guard watched from atop the wall. Go now! Make for the boats! Dana yelled. The sound of the horde chasing carried over the horses galloping. The wolves pounced and slashed at Dana's horse. There's too many of them, Marco cried. We'll never make it back to the boats. Keep riding, Dana ordered. From the corner of her eye, she could see the wolves running alongside on the rooftops. Marco's scream carried from beside her through the smoke. Marco! She kicked the horse, looking for more speed. She entered an open courtyard free of smoke and stopped. Wolves charged at her from every direction. The horse reared as claws tore through it. Dana fell backwards onto the stone path. Steel sang as she drew both short swords from her hips. She turned in a circle, blades at the ready. Hundreds of white eyes closed in. The red, fury-filled eyes of the Alpha stared down at her from the rooftop. The concrete path cracked beneath its feet as it landed in front of Dana. She crouched ready. I don't care what happens to me as long as I take you out before I'm dead. The enormous white wolf charged through, slashing and hacking through the other wolves. It crashed into the black alpha, sending it across the courtyard. The alpha's red eyes studied the white wolf, before jumping onto a nearby rooftop and sprinting away. The white wolf turned toward Dana. Its bright blue eyes sparkled. The other wolves charged at it, Blood filled the air in an exchange of furious swipes and slashes. All the wolves ignored Dana. Dana, grab on! Sebastian rode through the courtyard. Dana climbed onto the back of his horse. He rode for the exit. Wait! Dana screamed. It's not interested in us. It's killing the other wolves. Sebastian turned to see it was true. The white wolf was killing the others, but it was fighting a losing battle. Through the weight of numbers, it was being overpowered. We have to help it. Are you crazy? Sebastian asked. Help one of them? Gut feeling, Dana said. She jumped from the horse and charged at the horde. Yep, she's crazy, Sebastian muttered, charging after her. The white wolf lay flat on the ground. Blood poured from too many wounds to count, its breath ragged. Isabel and Petra rode into the courtyard. Marco was on the back of Isabel's horse. Glad to see you followed my order and didn't piss me off, Sebastian said. I almost didn't, Marco said. If Isabel hadn't come past when she did, I was done for. Gee, that's a big one, Petra said, eyeing the white wolf. Good work. Wasn't us, Sebastian replied. This one was protecting Dana from the others, apparently. In stunned silence, they all stared at the wolf. Dana couldn't believe her eyes. The wolf's skin and fur melted away leaving the injured body of a man. What the hell? Sebastian breathed. As the man's chest rose and fell with each breath, Dana felt her own breath catch. Roy? Chapter 4 So in war, the way is to avoid what is strong and strike at what is weak. Sun Tzu With the distant call of the Alpha, the remaining wolves fled Elmwood. Tears welled in Dana's eyes, the flames of hope building with each rise and fall of Roy's chest. Dana and the others, fixated on Roy, hadn't seen the members of the interior guard into the courtyard. It's one of them! Kill it! Five members of the interior guard strode toward Roy, swords drawn. 
No! Dana screamed. She turned on the guardsmen, short swords raised, positioned herself between them and her brother. Stand down! The captain of the guard demanded. Are you willing to die here? Dana's face hardened. Are you? Enough! The captain cried. Kill her and the wolf both! The guardsmen circled Dana and closed in. She held her short swords out and set her feet. Swords sang throughout the courtyard as Dana engaged the guardsmen. A boot caught her in the back and sent her face first to the ground. One guardsman advanced on Roy and lifted his sword. No! As his blade descended, it was stopped by another. Sebastian sent the guardsman backward with a kick to the stomach. The captain drew his longsword. I'll do it myself. A firm hand fell on his shoulder. The captain turned to see the commander of the interior guard, Lisa Irvin. I think the saviours of Elmwood have at least earned the right to speak, don't you, captain? Shock covered the captain's face. Commander Irvin. They're breaking the only oath we hold dear. They're protecting one of them. Commander Irvin stepped forward. She pulled the hood of her white cloak down. This isn't just any wolf. Her eyes drifted to Dana. Is this the white wolf? Dana gave a curt nod. This wolf saved as many lives as those brave warriors tonight. Commander Irvin looked at Roy, eyes filled with curiosity. As we made for the eastern harbour, I witnessed this wolf tear through the others with more rage than I've ever seen. If not for the white wolf, we'd have less than half the survivors that we do have. What do you think it's going to do if it turns again? Well, there's no other wolves around. How can you be sure it won't turn on us? The captain's grip on his longsword tightened. We should kill it here and now, and the traitors too. Commander Irvin was losing her patience. Not only do I think that's an unfair reward for our saviours, I also believe that unilateral decision exceeds your authority. Am I to understand you have given up on the chain of command? Sweat rolled down the captain's forehead. Commander Irvin was not a person to be trifled with. She was firm but fair. If he pushed his luck, they would execute him. The captain dropped the tip of his sword to the ground. What are your orders, Commander? I agree there is a risk, Captain, she eyed Sebastian. Chain the wolf in silver and shackle the other two. What? Sebastian roared. The three of them can stand trial in the capital. As I said, this kind of decision is above all of our authority. Isabel, Petra and Marco had watched the whole scene play out from the outskirts of the courtyard. Sebastian's eyes caught Isabel's fingers tighten around the handle of her sword. He gave his head a gentle shake. Isabel's fingers dropped away from the handle. The boat swayed gently in the water as it followed River Douglas toward Riverwall. Dana tapped her foot gently on the boards of her holding cell below deck. The hours had passed by. Her eyes were well adjusted to the gloom. What was waiting for her in the capital? A hero's welcome was unlikely, given her seating arrangements for the trip. Through the bars, she could just make out Roy, wrapped in chains. His breathing had settled. No longer the ragged, sharp throes of someone seriously injured. It now resembled something of a childhood memory. A gentle rhythmic hush of someone sleeping. How can he be so peaceful, wrapped neck to ankles in silver chains? Are you down here too, Dana? Sebastian's hushed question carried from the shadows of a cell further down. They brought Dana down separately. It wasn't until this moment that she knew Sebastian was down here with her. It's got to be you, surely. I don't know anyone else who taps their foot like you do when you're all cooped up. It's me, Dana breathed. Roy was the only person who ever noticed her foot tapping, or so she thought. What do you think they're going to do with us? Sebastian chuckled. Nothing good. Dana fought to let the next words out of her mouth. Thanks, Sebastian. For what? Dana's face tightened. For saving Roy back there. Me too, I guess. You're welcome. Sebastian? Dana cut herself off. Come on, I've got nowhere to be. You may as well ask. 
Sebastian knew the question already. You want to know why I stepped in to help? Yes. Dana felt the flush in her cheeks at her predictability. Well, I think you already know. But you seem intent on making me say it. The answer is simple. You and Roy are the closest thing I have to friends. I don't mean to be an A-grade arsehole all the time. It just seems to be how I am. Sebastian listened for a moment to Roy's gentle breathing. Roy's the only guy who'll sit with me at mealtime. Protecting him and his sister seemed like the friend thing to do. That might have been true a few days ago, Sebastian. But it isn't anymore. Sebastian's shackles rattled as he shifted. What do you mean by that? Petra, Marco, Thomas, Isabel, all the survivors of Elmwood. Me? Dana couldn't believe what she was about to say. Asshole or not, he came through for all of us when it counted. People will be fighting to sit next to you if we see another meal. In case I forget, remind me of something next time I come up with a plan that doesn't make me look like an asshole. What's that? Dana asked. How this one ended for us? Dana giggled. The giggle increased into laughter. Sebastian didn't know what to say as her laughter died down. Dana understood. She wasn't exactly comfortable with the conversation either. Thomas stood on the deck of the boat, his eyes glued to the riverbank. Henry and Susan were by his side, each clutching a leg. Thomas was happy to see that by some miracle, the horde had slowed. The boats were well ahead of them. But he found two things concerning. The first was the horde itself. The wolves were still organised, rolling like a wave towards Riverwall. Moving as one like they were, it was clearly the doing of the Alpha. It was the Alpha itself that was Thomas' the second point of concern. He'd studied the horde as the boats passed by. The Alpha wasn't among them. Thomas thought it unlikely the Alpha had fallen in Elmwood. The Horde's movements would have descended into anarchy if that were the case. So if the Alpha wasn't with the Horde, where was it? Thomas knew his comrades had survived the plan to free those trapped in Elmwood. Petra's shouting would have been heard all the way in the capital. She chastised the members of the Interior Guard all the way from the harbour to one of the other boats. Marco and Isabel accompanied her on the harbour, but they were later escorted to separate boats. From what Thomas had made out from her screaming, the interior guard placed Sebastian and Dana under arrest. But why? Thomas studied the faces of those around him. The boat was over capacity. There were more survivors behind the inner wall of Elmwood than he could have imagined. The interior guard had done a fantastic job of getting everyone evacuated from the outer regions. No, that's not it. The interior guard were nothing but lazy drunks. Never in a million years would they have thought the attack would happen. As such, they weren't prepared enough to do this well. And why offer such little resistance at the harbour? They clearly thought of the evacuation plan. Why not cover the escape route properly? A large shadow by the riverbank caught Thomas's eyes. Two glowing yellow eyes shone brightly like stars in the night sky. The large shape crawled into the river and disappeared. Thomas's eyes grew wide with realisation. They wanted us to board the boats. Thomas looked down at the clear water and the ripples approaching the boat in every direction. Oh no. The only way into river wall is through the river gate. The wolves are going to board the boats. The first claws gripped the side of the boat. Thomas pulled the kids into his arms and pushed toward the other side of the boat. Screams of agony filled his ears as the wolves tore the passengers apart. We have to swim for it. Terror filled Henry and Susan. If we get separated in the river, wait for me on the river bank. Thomas jumped over the side with the children's arms wrapped around his neck. Well, this can't be good. Sebastian heard the screams on the deck above. We meals and a lunchbox stuck down here. Dana was already on her feet. She studied her brother. Somehow, 
he was still sleeping soundly. Hey, someone get us out of here. Sebastian shook the metal bars of his cell. The screams grew louder as the door to the deck opened. Moonlight filtered through the doorway. The captain who'd wanted them dead in the courtyard hurried down the stairs. What's going on up there? Dana asked. The captain, seemingly surprised by her presence in the cell, remained silent. His entire body trembled as he dropped to his knees. The wolf charged through the doorway, leaping the stairs. The captain screamed as the wolf's jaws tore through his throat. His scream became a gurgle as blood sprayed the bars of Dana's cell. Her eyes fell on the set of keys on the captain's belt. The wolf turned to Dana and charged at the bars of the cell. They did their job. The wolf bounced to the floor and pounced back to its feet. Hey, ugly! Sebastian shook the bars of his cell. Over here! The wide eyes of the wolf fell on Sebastian. Razor-sharp claws clicked on the wooden floor as it stepped towards his cell. That's it! Come and get me! The wolf stopped abruptly outside Roy's cell. There was an audible sound as it sniffed toward Roy's body. The wolf reared its head back. The wolf rushed up the stairs and back onto the deck out of sight. What do you think that was about? Sebastian asked. Dana was reaching through the bars toward the keys on the captain's belt. I have no idea, she strained, but I'm not planning on sticking around to find out. Thomas pulled himself from the water to the riverbank. The howl from the boat in the middle of the fleet had cut over the screams. The capital was in sight on the horizon. Flames of the torches of the river wall licked and bounced. His attack was timed perfectly. Perched on a rocky outcrop above the river, the red eyes of the Alpha blazed. The wolves jumped from the other boats and converged toward the boat in the centre. I have to find Henry and Susan. Thanks, Sebastian said as Dana opened the door of his cell. She opened Roy's cell and the lock securing the silver chains around his body. Wake up! Dana shook Roy's shoulders. We have to go! Get up! Roy failed to stir. The sounds from above became deafening from the pounding of claws as wolves flooded the deck. Sebastian's eyes were drawn to the shadows flooding the doorway above and the countless pairs of white eyes. The wolves charged down the stairs and took Dana and Sebastian to the ground. The white wolf charged from the cell, its claws wrapped around the heads of the wolves attacking Sebastian and Dana. Blood sprayed their faces as the white wolf crushed the skulls of the wolves, pinning them down. The white wolf turned and attacked the rest of the wolves below deck. Unlike the courtyard, the wolves couldn't surround the white wolf to overpower it. In the confined space, they were helpless to do anything but die. Heads rolled, torn from shoulders one after the other, the white wolf pushing the horde back toward the doorway. Your brother is definitely a leave it to the last second kind of guy, Dana. Sebastian helped Dana from the floor. They followed the white wolf up to the deck. The horde of wolves were backing away. The black alpha watched on from above. Every wolf on the deck jumped overboard into the water. He's got them running scared, Sebastian chuckled. Dana remained unconvinced. They all jumped overboard at the alpha's call. They were following orders. The boat lurched as the hulking beast landed on the deck. It was no ordinary wolf. The bright yellow eyes of the beast focused on the white wolf. It stood on four large powerful legs, the head and jaws of a wolf, but a body and a tail covered in green scales reminiscent of a crocodile. The white wolf was enormous, but this beast dwarfed it. The white wolf charged. With surprising speed, the beast flicked its tail and sent the white wolf reeling backward. Sebastian picked up a bow and arrows from the fingers of a dead guardsman. With his boot, he slid a second toward Dana. She picked it up, and the pair unloaded a volley of arrows at the beast. 
The silver-tipped arrows bounced off the beast's armor-plated skin. Now what? Sebastian yelled. Dana signaled to her eyes. Sebastian nodded with understanding. Together! The white wolf scrambled to its feet and held its ground, as if also understanding. The black alpha's jaw curled into a snarl, resembling a smile, as it watched from above. It failed to sense the silent footsteps coming from behind. The alpha lurched forward as the short sword pierced through its back and out through its chest. A shriek of pain followed as the alpha dropped from the rocks and crashed into the water below. The figure in the red cloak stared down at the boat below and the massive beast on the deck. The boat lurched with each step of the beast as it closed in on the white wolf. Dana and Sebastian stood with arrows notched. Now! Sebastian yelled. The arrows sailed through the air and hit their mark. The beast rocked back as the arrow tips cannoned into its eyes. It rose to stand on its back legs, revealing its soft belly. The white wolf charged forward, crashing into the beast. It pushed it toward the edge of the deck. The white wolf howled in pain as the jaws of the beast tore into its shoulder. The figure in the red cloak jumped from the rocky outcrop above and crashed into the sail of the boat. The figure's short sword pierced the sail and sliced through as they slid down to the deck. Sebastian and Dana knew the woman well. The red cloak, silver eyes. This was Captain Zoe Lockhart of the Hunter Force. Zoe sent the sword sailing from her hand. The blade pierced through the beast's chest, sending it overboard into the river. The white wolf fell to its knees. The wolf melted away, leaving only Roy clutching the fresh wound to his shoulder. Sebastian and Dana rushed across the deck to help him. Zoe eyed the three of them curiously. Does someone want to fill me in on what the fuck just happened? Chapter 5 The best weapon against an enemy is another enemy. Friedrich Nietzsche Thomas watched the Black Alpha fall from the rocky outcrop to the water below. He'd seen the large creature forced from the boat. Terrified faces of the people from the boats passed by in a blur as he searched desperately for Henry and Susan. Damn. This is the one time I didn't want to be right. The wolves were no longer interested in following orders with the alpha out of action. White eyes aboard the boats turned their attention to the frightened people on the riverbank. The river took the form of an ocean wave. The surface of the water crashed beneath the horde as they jumped from the boats in a mad race. A high-pitched scream carried over the noise. Susan! The small girl sprinted into the trees, pursued by snarling wolves. Susan's heart pounded in her chest. She dared not look back. Branches whipped at her face as she ran. Tears blurred her vision. She was all alone. The forest was unfamiliar to her each passing tree looking the same as the last. The snarling and heavy steps drew closer. No! Susan cried. A rock face blocked her path forward. The sobbing child crumpled to the ground. White eyes appeared from the shadows around her. Susan was trapped, with nowhere left to run. She crawled backwards. The rock face was cool to the touch as she leaned against it. Susan's body trembled as the wolves circled and closed in. She squeezed her eyes closed. Tears rolled down her cheeks. This was the end. Somewhere through the fog of fear, the sound of running steps entered Susan's mind. A shadow leapt from the darkness. The knife's blade glistened in the moonlight. The ground shook as the wolf fell lifelessly to the ground by the tiny girl. The wind rushed from Susan's body as she was lifted from the ground. She dared not open her eyes. You're okay. I've got you. Thomas's whisper was the greatest sound she'd ever heard. But the other sounds were still there too. The wolves were still chasing. The river wall gate thundered as it struggled open, allowing the Elmwood fleet to enter the capital. Torches lit the way toward the harbour. The sun was rising on the horizon. Sebastian's mouth hung open. There was almost no one left on any of the boats. A stark contrast from the crowds he'd witnessed board back in Elmwood. His eyes found Commander Lisa Irving. She stared back coldly. What's her problem? Roy asked. 
Now let me guess, she had the pleasure of meeting you already. Your ability to get everyone to hate you is the stuff of legend, Sebastian. I wouldn't joke, Captain Zoe Lockhart said. Her red cloak whipped with the gentle breeze. She doesn't care about anyone. It's no secret that Commander Irving has always looked at people as tools to get what she wants. Captain, Dana began. What do you think they're going to do to us? Couldn't say. Please call me Zoe. She turned away from them. They'll probably have a hearing, but they'll have already made up their mind before that. So I climbed the railing. I'll find out what I can, see if I can't save you from the executioner's blade. Zoe dove overboard. The surface of the water barely broke as she disappeared beneath. Sweat poured from Petra's forehead as she sprinted through the trees for the river wall and the safety of the capital. Henry clung tightly to her neck as she carried him. Tears rolled from his closed eyes as he worried for his sister. Susan's scream cut through the air. That's my sister, Henry moaned. Petra changed direction toward the scream. The forest opened into a small field. At the centre, Thomas stood with his knife, and Susan clutched his leg. They were surrounded by wolves. Henry, climb one of the trees and stay quiet. Petra set the boy down silently. With care, she slid the bow from her shoulder. She eyed Henry as he struggled to pull himself higher through the branches, silently willing him to hurry. Once his terrified eyes signalled he was as high as he intended to climb, Petra notched her first arrow. The whistling cut through the air. The wolf gave a grunt. Light faded from its eyes as it slammed limp to the grass. Petra notched and loosed again. Get out of there! Thomas picked Susan up by the waist with one arm and sprinted for the opening in the pack Petra created. Henry, jump! The boy dropped into Petra's arms and climbed onto her back. Thanks, Thomas breathed as he locked step with Petra and they sprinted into the trees. The pack gave chase. Petra was moving on nothing but determination now. Exhaustion threatened to stop her with every step. Ah! Petra's boot caught on an exposed root. She slammed into the dirt face first. The steps of the pack closed in. Thomas helped her up. Too late. The pack had them surrounded. So this is how we go out. It's been an honour. Thomas pulled his knife from his belt. Henry, when Petra and I create a hole, I want you to take your sister and run. Don't look back. No, Susan sobbed. The earth shook beneath their feet. Petra's eyes grew wide as the gigantic beast tore through the forest toward them. Half crocodile, half wolf, covered head to toe in green scales. It trampled over the wolves. They exploded beneath the beast's feet like bugs. The beast stood eye to eye with Thomas and Petra, even though it was standing on all fours. Susan and Henry cowered behind their protectors. The beast opened its jaws wide, inches from Petra's face. Petra turned her head away and closed her eyes. Thomas's fingers tightened around the handle of his knife. The beast closed its mouth and lumbered away. Petra's wide eyes filled with disbelief. What was that thing? It attacked the boats earlier, Thomas replied. Seems it's not as aggressive when the Alpha isn't in control. Although I think we should use this time to get as much distance as we can between us and it, in case it changes its mind. Agreed. Petra picked up Henry and they resumed their sprint for the river wall. Water dripped from Marco's body as he wandered between the trees. The river wall can't be much further now. A feeling of eyes on him made him stop. The sun was rising, but not high enough to light the way between the trees. You make too much noise, Isabel said as she rose from the scrub. Marco smiled. What is there to be worried about out here? Isabel rolled her eyes. Confidence doesn't suit you. 
Heat rose in Marco's cheeks. Hurried footsteps caught his attention. Get down! Marco dove in the scrub beside Isabel. Petra's familiar blonde hair flashed past. Isabel's heart soared. Why are you in such a hurry, Stinky? Petra and Thomas stopped dead in their tracks, relief evident on their faces. We smelt you coming a mile away. Petra frowned at the insult. We didn't know if you guys made it, Thomas said, placing Susan down. Isabel rushed Petra and threw her arms around her. Henry and Petra both cried out as Isabel squeezed them. Sorry, she muttered, stepping back. It's just good to see you. Petra relayed what they'd seen on the remaining walk to Riverwall. Wait, so that crocodile thing saved you guys? Confusion covered Marco's face. Why? Does it matter? Isabel asked. I'm just glad it did. Me too, Susan whispered. Still, Marco said. It doesn't seem right to me. Thomas remained quiet while Petra filled them in. Feeling outnumbered, Marco turned to him now. What do you make of it all, Thomas? Well, Thomas had been considering the question for a while. I think the Alpha controls all of them. It seems that particular one has independent thought like Roy. Why it chose to attack the boats but made the decision to save us, I don't know. The trees gave way, revealing the heavily guarded river wall. Identify yourselves, came the order from high on the wall. 14th Reavers, 1st Platoon. Petra shouted back. Now quit stuffing around and open the damn gate. This is complete horseshit, Roy muttered as he paced the cell. Should we have let them all die instead? Dana sat with her back to the wall, tapping her feet on the stone ground. It'll work itself out. Roy laughed. I wish I had your confidence. He gripped the cell bars. Sebastian was sitting in the cell opposite. What do you think of all this? You don't want to know, Sebastian muttered. Sure I do. Sebastian let out a sigh. I think we're dead. Huh? Dana's eyes grew wide. Think about it, Sebastian replied. Everyone knows Lisa Irvin has eyes for more. As the commander of the Elmwood Interior Guard, that massacre makes her look bad. Yeah, so? Roy was growing irritated. The way I see it, we're a way she can make herself the hero. Sebastian gave time for the words to sink in. Commander Irving can say she held out, got as many people to safety as she could. That bitch will use us to grow a legend. She'll blame us for the deaths. Paint you as wolf scum, and your sister and I as traitorous conspirators working with the wolves. All of her men watched us defend you at Elmwood. Why didn't she just kill us in the courtyard? Dana asked. Sebastian smirked. He didn't know for sure, but he had a fair idea. Doing a trial and making it public gives her more eyes and shows she's fair. Dana's eyes remained wide. She knew Sebastian was right. The cell bars clanged as Roy put his boot into them. A bitch! I've been called worse, I guess. Sally Lockhart stepped from the shadows. Her brown eyes studied Roy. How long have you been listening? Dana asked. Zoe smiled. Long enough. So what did you find out? Sebastian asked. So he turned to his cell. That you're smarter than you look? Sebastian nodded. What's that supposed to mean? Roy asked. Dana dropped her head to her knees. That Sebastian's guess about what they have planned for us is right, she whispered. Commander Irving will never admit it, but yes. So he sat on the floor between the cells. Elmwood damaged her reputation. She's prosecuting against the three of you at a formal hearing. I think it's to make herself look good by having you found guilty. If she's successful, she'll use it to mitigate the casualties at Elmwood. How was she supposed to anticipate and prepare to fight against a threat from within the ranks? Roy kicked the cell bars again. So that's it then. We die so she doesn't look bad. Is he always this angry? So he asked. Sebastian nodded. If that's what's going to happen, why come here? Dana asked. Zoe's eyes focused on Roy. Curiosity. Roy laughed. Well, now you've seen the freak, I hope you're satisfied. 
What would you do if you got out of here alive? Zoe asked. What do you want more than anything else? Sebastian didn't bother looking up. He'd listened to Roy for years. He already knew the answer. Roy's face twisted into a snarl. To kill every wolf there is. Zoe gave a nod as she rose from the floor. That's all I wanted to know. She slipped back into the shadows and out of sight. Zoe slipped into the hunter garrison on the outskirts of the capital. Two wolves snapped and snarled from behind the cage walls made from silver. Just my babies, Captain, Mindy Riggs said. Mindy's glasses too big for her face slipped down her nose. They were trapped below deck on one of the Elmwood boats. Wasn't too difficult to get them back here. Excitement was painted on Mindy's face as she stepped closer to the cage. One of the wolves slammed into the bars and swiped at her, narrowly missing. Mindy laughed as she stepped back. That was close, wasn't it? You are a feisty one. She turned to Zoe. How was your little excursion? Zoe considered the question. Fruitful. Mindy clapped her hands excitedly. Ooh, goody. I shall fetch the others. Word of the trial had reached Petra shortly after they entered the capital. Her protests fell on deaf ears. If not for Isabel dragging her away, she'd probably be sharing a cell with Sebastian, Dana and Roy right now. She found herself exhausted but unable to sleep. Envy filled her as she eyed the others. Thomas and Marco were sleeping on the stone floor. Henry and Susan were sharing the bed. Isabel, meanwhile, was seated next to Petra, her head resting on her shoulder. Isabel's snoring was loud at the best of times. Petra suspected she'd be deaf in the left ear by morning. I can't stink too bad if you can get that comfortable this close to me. Petra was surprised to find Marco awake staring at her. There was a look in his eyes that she'd never seen before. He seemed angry that Isabel was resting against her. Is he jealous? she wondered. The door to the small room opened. The woman in the red cloak entered, glasses wearing face beaming. Who are you? Petra asked. I'm Mindy. I was wondering if you'd like to help me save your friends. Chapter 6 Choices are the hinges of destiny. Pythagoras Commander Edmund Williams listened intently as Zoe passed on all she'd witnessed and a conversation in the cells. The mid-morning sun kissed the courtyard of the hunter barracks. His troops trained, unaware their commander was watching. There's not many of us left, Zoe. Every time we leave, we seek battle. Ours is not a fight for survival, but a death wish. Zoe nodded. Over the years, she'd grown to respect her commander, not only as a leader, but as a friend. It was now commonplace for him to speak openly in front of his captain. The interior guard cowers behind the walls. The Reavers only engage the enemy when they attack. We seek them out. The youthful faces in the courtyard expressed a range of emotions. Edmund had seen them all before. Fear. Excitement. Resignation. Bravery. Cluelessness. Edmund knew it made no difference. By the end of the next engagement with the enemy, that all be dead. This was the order of things now. Most of his veterans were long gone. Fresh-faced graduates replenished his ranks, ready for the meat grinder. Other than Mindy, who else knows all of what you've told me? No one, Zoe replied. If Mindy successfully gained the help of the boy's friends not in a jail cell, they will know some, but nothing of our further suspicions. Edmund turned away from the window, his grey eyes meeting his captain's. Keep it that way. Zoe nodded. The first hurdle will be the trial. We'll decide what we do next after that. There's no point planning any further if we fail today. Zoe headed for the door. Are you comfortable with what I've asked you to do today? Edmund asked. 
I'll understand if you're not. Say the word and we can keep going the way we are instead. Zoe paused as her fingers fell on the door handle. The risk is worth it. It's the only option. She slipped through the doorway without looking back. Dana sat in silence with her back to the jail cell wall. Roy's anger had given in to exhaustion. Sebastian was lost in his own thoughts. This left Dana with nothing to do but watch the shadows stretch along the stone floor with the movement of the sun. How long do you think they plan on keeping us down here? Roy asked. The door at the end of the hallway opened. Had to open your mouth, Sebastian replied. Surprise filled Dana as at least 50 interior guardsmen entered the cell block kitted in kill gear. They're not taking any chances. The guardsman dragged Sebastian from his cell first and placed him in shackles. Dana didn't see the point in struggling as they did the same to her. Her eyes fell on Roy's face. She knew the look in his eye. He's contemplating escape. Dana gave a subtle shake of her head. Roy relaxed. He allowed the guardsman to shackle him in silver. The shackles jingled with each step as Dana, Roy and Sebastian were marched out of the cell block and upstairs. More guardsmen were waiting at the top. In unison they opened the doors to the Grand Hall. Dana had never seen the hall so crowded. Along one side, members of the interior guard filled the gallery. Members of the Reavers and Hunters filled the other side. Members of the public filled the second level. More off-putting than the large number of the crowd was their silence. The only audible sound in the hall was her shackles and those of Roy and Sebastian as the guardsmen marched them forward. Roy and Sebastian hung their heads as they walked. Dana studied the faces of those in the crowd as she passed them. The contrast was stark. A uniform look of contempt adorned the faces of the interior guard. Dana's poker face held firm but the contempt was mutual. It was easy to explain the contrast in numbers. The interior guard hid behind the safety of the river wall, while the reavers and hunters did the dying to protect them. In front of the judge's chair, three metal poles were positioned to the stone ground. Dana made no moves to resist as the guardsmen shackled her chains to the poles. The door at the back of the room opened. General Xavier Gordon entered the hall, flanked by two guardsmen. He stood in front of his chair and saluted the flag hanging on the wall above. The flag of red, white and blue, signifying the three military branches of humanity. General Gordon sat. Sebastian and Roy's heads remained bowed. Dana stared the general down. General Gordon spoke. This military hearing has been called to try the three held before me. For fairness and transparency, the trial has been opened to the public. Charges of conspiracy against humanity have been brought forward. The maximum punishment if found guilty is death. Kill them, came the cry from the public gallery. General Gordon's face hardened. The gallery was open to the public as a privilege. Any further outbursts will see the privilege revoked and those responsible being arrested. The general gave sufficient time for the warning to be heard. You've heard the charge. How do you three plead? Not guilty, Dana said. She caught two sets of eyes staring at her from the gallery. Samuel and Dane Morris. So that's who got away. The last time she'd seen either of them was their white cloaks fleeing from the gates back at Elmwood. They both looked away. (sighs) Doesn't matter. Sebastian muttered. You've already made up your mind. Roy spat on the floor. Thanks a bunch, guys, Dana thought. General Gordon, unfazed by the reactions, continued. Commander Irving of the Interior Guard will bring forward the case against the accused parties. Thank you, General. Lisa Irvin stood in the gallery. The three before you are Sebastian Allen, Dana Sterling and Roy Barrett. They have all served since fighting age for the Reavers' 14th platoon. During the recent attack of Elmwood at the hands of the Wolf Horde, 
It is irrefutable that Roy Barrett is indeed a wolf. I witnessed this myself, as did numerous other witnesses. During the apprehension of Barrett, Reavers Sterling and Allen made attempts to prevent members of the Interior Guard from carrying out that arrest. Are you seeking the death penalty for these allegations if proven here today? General Gordon asked. Yes, General. We were caught by surprise at Elmwood. It is my firm belief that these three aided the assault. With their aid, the wolves inflicted significant death and destruction on Elmwood, forcing the city to fall. Lisa Irving turned to the men and women around her. If not for the bravery of the Interior Guard, the death toll would have been much higher. Bullshit! Dana spat. The Interior Guard were cowering behind the inner wall when we arrived. If not for us and my brother turning into a wolf, you'd all be dead. You should be on your hands and knees thanking us. Order! General Gordon shouted. I will not have these proceedings drift into anarchy. You will have your chance to speak. A smile crossed Lisa Irving's lips. She held a piece of paper aloft. It seems like the natural time in proceedings to reveal this. What is the document you possess, Commander? It is Dana Sterling's record. She lied to join the Reavers. Dana stared daggers toward Commander Irving. It has been discovered that Sterling's birth name is indeed Barrett. She is the biological sister of the wolf. It seems she lied to stay by her brother's side. General Gordon stroked his chin. While concerning, surely it's understandable the girl wished to stay in close proximity to her brother. You would think so, General, but now I fear something more sinister. The proximity would certainly have made life easier for them in any plans to take Elmwood. Kill her! She's a wolf too! Get that man out of here, General Gordon boomed. Proceedings halted while the interior guard removed the heckler from the public gallery. This is certainly troubling, Commander Irving. He turned to the other side of the gallery. Commander Williams, it is my understanding that you wish to speak on the accused's behalf. Is that correct? Yes, General. Commander Williams stood. The version of events presented by Commander Irving is in stark contrast to the reports I received. Before you and Shackles are the heroes of Elmwood. If not for the bravery of a handful of Reavers, and the assistance given by Roy Barrett in wolf form, the survivors in Elmwood would not have made it to the boats and escaped. So what do you propose then, Commander? General Gordon asked. Even if what you say is true, the boy still poses significant risk. How can we be sure he won't attack us in the future? Give them to me, Commander Williams said. Mitigate the risk. Make them hunters. They won't be in the city anymore. Them? I would like to offer the other members of the Reavers who are in Elmwood a position within the hunters. By giving us nothing but green recruits, my soldiers are dying quicker than I can replenish them. Six soldiers with combat experience and a werewolf will greatly assist in our missions going forward. With all due respect, General, Lisa Irving interjected, Commander Williams wasn't at Elmwood, nor were any of his hunters. I assure you he received no such version of events from any member of the Interior Guard. It must have come from the friends of the accused. She stared at Commander Williams. Am I wrong? Sebastian started laughing. I assure you this is no laughing matter, General Gordon said coolly. Sebastian laughed harder. I should have let you all die, Roy screamed at the interior guard. You're nothing but cowards, more interested in how you look than doing your job. Zoe bounded from the gallery to the centre of the hall. Roy's head rocked back into the metal pole as Zoe kicked him. She kicked him twice more in the stomach. You want him dead, Commander Irving? But have you thought about how that happens? Lisa didn't respond. Are you going to do it? Your men? I'd be surprised if any of you have ever killed a wolf. Most of you have never been near one. Do you think this boy is going to let you kill him? If he is in fact a threat? What happens when he turns on you? Zoe pulled a knife from her boot. No! Dana screamed as Zoe forced it into Roy's chest. Roy grunted in pain. Zoe cut him free of his chains and pulled the knife from his chest. Let's put it all to the test. It's the only way to be sure. She stabbed Roy twice more. Come on, Barrett, kill me if you can. Fury filled Roy's eyes, but he remained with the pole. So this is what defeated you at Elmwood, Commander? 
Zoe shot Lisa a grin. This is ridiculous. Are you going to allow this to continue, General? Lisa asked. Are you done, Captain? The General asked. Not quite. A whistle hung from Zoe's neck. She brought it to her lips. The wolf struggled against its restraints in the darkened corridor behind the Grand Hall. I thought you stank, Isabel muttered, as she and Petra struggled with the pole connected to the restraints around the wolf's neck. Give it a rest, Isabel, Marco said from the other side of the wolf, where he and Thomas were struggling with the other pole. The faint sound of the whistle carried along the corridor. Ooh, here we go, it's showtime, Mindy cooed, opening the door. Mindy burst through the door into the grand hall with her arms extended out. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, let me introduce my special new friend, Benjamin. She pushed her glasses up her nose back in place and motioned toward the others. Gasps and screams rose through the hall as Isabel and the others led the snarling wolf through the doorway. Like a conductor, Mindy signalled for the others to release the wolf from its restraints. Mindy, Isabel and the others backed away. The wolf's wide eyes darted around the hall. It settled on the interior guard and dove toward Commander Irving. The white wolf crash-tackled the other wolf mid-leap and brought it to the ground. The white wolf's jaw crushed the other wolf's head. Screams of panic carried around the gallery. Soldiers on either side of the hall sat in stunned silence. The blue eyes of the white wolf studied them all before dropping to its knees. The white wolf melted away, leaving only Roy. Guess that proves my point, doesn't it? So he said with a chuckle. Of all the interior guards sitting here today, not one of you reacted to a single wolf in time to save your own life. I'll have your head for this, Commander Irving boomed. Then what? Zoe asked. I don't know if you've been keeping track of events. Rainwell? Elmwood? What's next? What hope do any of you have when the wolves breach the river wall of the capital? Enough, Captain Lockhart, Commander William said. Zoe nodded. You've made your point. Indeed, General Gordon was still striking his chin. This outburst was one of the more reckless things I've had the pleasure of witnessing. To risk everyone's life in this room on a hunch. He turned to Commander Williams. But I believe your point has been made, Edmund. If the boy meant us any harm, he would have shown it now. Which leaves me with a decision to make. Edmund, if I give you the boy and his friends, are you prepared to bear the consequences if it goes wrong? I have no problem holding you responsible if people die as a result. Commander Williams gave a nod. I am prepared to carry that burden, General. Very well. Roy Barrett, Sebastian Allen and Dana Sterling... You are hereby released from custody, and you are now members of the Hunters under the command of Edmund Williams. The General turned to Isabel and the others. As are you four. Mindy shot the General a cheesy grin. Sebastian and Dana carried Roy to the couch in Commander Williams' office and set him down. Roy's shirt had become covered in blood due to the stab wounds inflicted by Zoe. Was all of this really necessary? Dana asked, her hands hovering over Roy's chest. I believe it was, Commander Williams replied. I'm fine, Roy said. Zoe jumped on the couch and draped her arm over Roy's shoulder. Are we going to have a problem after that? She asked. Roy shook his head. No. I mean, it hurt, but I get why you did it. Mindy rushed in, clapping her hands. Let me see, let me see! She tore Roy's shirt open. Huh? The wounds in Roy's chest were already completely healed over. You heal even faster than the ones in the wild. I mean, what's it been? Five minutes? Chapter 7 No battle was ever won according to plan. But no battle was ever won without one. Dwight Eisenhower The hunters on watch at the barracks remained vigilant despite the cool snap of the breeze. Darker than usual, the clouds prevented the moonlight from breaking through. (coughs) 
The captured wolf grew restless in its cage, forged from silver. It was always more restless at night. It put the hunters on edge. Most weren't comfortable with the enemy within their walls. Unbeknownst to them all, there was another creature within the walls of the hunter barracks on this pitch black night. With a speed difficult to pick up during daylight, let alone pitch darkness, this silent death moved forward unseen by all, except the caged wolf. With a flash of claws, the lock of the cage cracked open. The sound reverberated throughout the barracks. Get to the cage, came the cry. The wolf inside had no chance to react. Its head slammed into the bars of the cage, ripped clean from its body. The silent assassin was gone before the wolf's body hit the ground with a thud. What can you tell me about last night? Edmund asked from the seat behind his desk. Nothing useful, so he replied, sitting down on the chair opposite. Someone, or something I should say, judging from the damage to the cage, got past all the hunters on duty without being seen. The captured wolf was killed. Whatever did it got back out without being sighted despite the hunters being alerted to the noise. Hmm. Edmund ran his hand through his hair. I think that's more useful than you realise, Zoe. How so? The wolves are clearly more intelligent than we've given them credit for. Edmund stood and stared through the window at the hunters below. They've switched tactics. The horde of Elmwood has become disorganised and running wild between there and the capital. The forward march from city to city has ended. So he smiled. Maybe I killed the Black Alpha when I stabbed it through the heart. Maybe, Edmund replied. I have my doubts. We've seen the punishment Roy Barrett can withstand. It's safe to assume the other uniques are similar. Uniques have become the term to describe those wolves clearly different to the others. Well, I'm sure you have a theory, Commander. Zoe said. She respected Edmund, but his habit of labouring towards his point irked. Correct, Edmund replied, his eyes still surveying the courtyard below. I believe the emergence of Roy Barrett as a wolf caught them off guard. I think they've shifted their focus. His eyes found Sebastian training new recruits. How is our new acting captain taking to his role? Zoe laughed. He's kind of an arsehole. Edmund turned towards Zoe, a smile on his face. Reminds me of someone else I know. Get stuffed, Zoe replied. Edmund put his hands up in surrender. I meant no offence. If he's anything like you, I'm very happy he's with us. Way to turn an insult into a compliment, Edmund. The pair sat in a comfortable silence for a moment. If you are right, Edmund, about the wolves, what's our next move? I know you're not the kind of man to sit idle and wait for them to strike. I know Roy Barrett's trial was your first move of many. What's next? I do have a plan. Edmund's grey eyes hardened. But if it's going to work, it needs to stay between us. Commander Edmund Williams had ridden for Wickermore with a hundred hunters four hours earlier. Wickermore was a small village at the east of Elmwood. The plan was simple in theory, yet everyone remaining within the barracks was on edge. The hope was Wickermore will have been far enough away from the larger towns to have been missed by the Horde, and then due to its proximity would become the staging ground for an advance to retake Elmwood. Are you across the plan? Zoe asked. The other captains exchanged glances. Mindy seemed unfazed. Looks of concern painted Hector Helmuth and Daniel Arnold. Neither Hector nor Daniel were known for their intelligence. Both men were battle-tested. Hector was strong as an ox. Daniel, slender and lightning quick. Sebastian, meanwhile, simply felt like he didn't belong with them. We well, don't all answer at once, Zoe spat. We know what we're doing, Zoe, Mindy said with a smile. Well, most of us do. She shot Sebastian a sideways glance. If the wolves attack while we're pulling supplies, we're sitting ducks, Hector said. Did you listen to anything I just said? Mindy slapped the back of Hector's head. 
It's the job of Sebastian's platoon to take them down. That's why we're moving during the day. So we can tell him where they are. I'm not sure that makes it any better, Daniel said. Zoe heard enough. All of you get your guys ready. We leave in 30. Are you okay? Dana asked. You seem off. Sebastian lied. Yeah, I'm okay. He was on his way to brief his platoon. Dana locked step and walked beside him. You'll do fine, she whispered. You're a better leader than you realise. You'll be a commander one day. Wait and see. Sebastian's eyes widened in surprise. Did I hear that right? Did you just give me a compliment, Sterling? Dana felt the heat rise in her cheeks. I guess I did. Sebastian's platoon of twenty were waiting by their horses. All rookies, all young. The captain's kind of an arsehole, isn't he? Oliver Wilson quipped beneath his red hair. All the cute ones are, Rachel Stein added. Sebastian's knuckles cracked as his fists tightened. Dana cleared her throat. You don't know how lucky you are to have him. Shock covered the recruits' faces. Under normal circumstances, 95% of you newbies die in the field on their first mission. Dana enjoyed the terror her first comment drew out of them. Captain Allen is the best man I've ever fought beside. Two of you making it back alive from this mission means he's done his job. Lucky for you, Captain Allen won't be satisfied with that result. He's saved more people from dying than anyone left alive. I hope you know how lucky you all are to have this cute asshole in charge. Sebastian didn't know what to say. Sorry, Captain, Oliver said. I'm just nervous. I don't know what I'm saying. Sebastian waved it off. Don't worry about it. I won't see you again until Wickermore, Dana said. Stay safe. She held her hand out. Sebastian took it. You too. Dana found the others killing time together before the mission. Where's Roy? she asked. Zoe came and collected him a few minutes ago. Didn't say why, Petra replied. Thomas's face held a look of concern. Damn, Marco said. You're the smartest one out of all of us. If you're this worried, that means we all should be. Huh? Thomas hadn't been paying attention. Oh, I'm sure we'll be fine. Out with it, Isabel demanded. You aren't looking like someone who thinks this is all going to be fine. I can only see it going one of two ways, Thomas began. The horde remains in disarray, and this all goes fine. Or? Isabel asked. It's exactly what the wolves want us to do, and we're riding into a trap. <laughs> awesome, Marco laughed. Either we all die or no one does. Way to leave room for the middle ground. Commander Williams isn't stupid, Dana said. I'm sure he's considered that too. Has he, though? Petra asked. He's a man used to high casualty rates. I'm not sure he cares. Well, I guess it doesn't matter. Dana turned to walk away. Either way, as long as we all make it, I don't care. Dana sat a horse in the convoy waiting for the barracks gate to open. Many had come to see them off, members of the public and soldiers alike. Many of her former comrades from the Reavers wore their white cloaks in the crowd. Dana hadn't managed to find Roy. He was at the head of the convoy with Zoe. He was now part of her platoon. All of them had been spread throughout the ranks to add experience. Of her friends, only Thomas was in her platoon, under the command of Captain Hector Helmuth. Wait! Susan cried. You can't go yet! She and Henry ran towards Dana and Thomas. We made these for you both, for luck. Susan and Henry each handed Thomas and Dana a woven bracelet. Thank you, Thomas said, sliding it onto his wrist. The gates of the barracks opened. Okay, step back, Dana said. We'll see you both when we get back. Despite the wagons in the convoy carrying provisions, the speed they were travelling surprised Sebastian. At this pace they'd reach Wickermore within an hour. Wolves on the right, came the call. A pack of ten wolves raced across the field from the tree line toward the convoy. Forth on me, Sebastian cried, wheeling his horse. Steele sang as he drew his sword. The first wolf bounded through the air towards Sebastian. Blood sprayed as he swung true. 
Screams erupted as his recruits began to fall. A feeling of helplessness washed over him as he was powerless to save them all. Rachel screamed as two wolves brought her horse down. She fell with the weight of the horse landing on top of her. A sickening crack filled the air as her legs snapped under the weight. Rachel closed her eyes and covered her face as the wolves closed in. Sebastian jumped from his horse and cut them both down from behind. Rachel screamed as she felt hands on her shoulder. I've got you, Sebastian reassured her. Her scream morphed into one of pain as her broken leg shifted. Oliver! Sebastian barked. The terrified boy rode over. Get her back to the convoy. Sebastian threw her up behind Oliver and slapped the horse to get it moving. Sebastian surveyed the field. Only six of his riders remained. Twelve dead already, he muttered. Some leader I am. He knew they only survived because the wolves were too busy eating their friends. If there'd been more wolves, they'd all be dead. Sebastian caught movement from his right. Out of instinct, he brought his sword up. Sebastian was knocked backwards as the claws struck. The purple shape moved in a blur. Two of his riders fell, throat slashed open. A unique... The purple wolf stopped in the field and locked eyes with Sebastian, and in a blur it took off toward the convoy. Sebastian climbed back onto his horse. Back to the convoy! The four remaining members of his squad fell in behind him. Dana's eyes remained on the field, watching for Sebastian's return. She saw it coming, but it was too fast for it to even speak. Horror filled her as the claws flashed. Thomas! He reached for his throat as the claws opened it up. Blood spilled as Thomas dropped lifelessly from his horse. Unique! came the cry. The purple wolf changed direction and slammed into the wagon sitting behind the head of the convoy. The ground erupted as wolves leapt from the dirt to surround them. I can help them! Roy screamed. No! So he ordered. Our mission is to ride for Wickermore. That's what we're doing. Roy moved to ride around her. Zoe blocked his path. That's not your fight. Do as you're told. Roy stared daggers at his captain. Move it! Roy relented and wheeled toward Wickermore. They were now only twenty, Zoe and Roy leading. Without the wagons, they picked up speed. Roy glanced back. The purple wolf was gaining ground on them fast. I can beat it! No! Zoe yelled. Keep moving! Zoe waved her hand. Four riders dropped back to engage the wolf. Their screams quickly followed. She waved her hand again. More riders dropped back. The village came into view. Don't stop, Zoe commanded. Only Roy and Zoe remained as they entered the village. Roy glanced back. Don't you dare, Zoe boomed. They passed the village centre. The purple wolf was right behind them. The snap was deafening as the large silver bear trap erupted from the dirt path. The wolf cried out as its legs were severed above the knees. It barreled through the dirt past Zoe and Roy. Now! Edmund cried. Red hunter cloaks appeared on the surrounding rooftops. Whistling cut through the air as the soldiers fired their crossbows. The purple wolf screamed in agony as the bolts of silver tore through its body. Blood poured from the stumps where its legs used to be. Reload and fire again! Edmund boomed. The second volley tore through the purple wolf, pinning it to the ground. The wolf's breathing grew shallow. It sucked in air and cried out. Sebastian returned to the convoy to see the battle ended. The ambush was unsuccessful. The wolves had lost. But many hunters lie dead or dying. He found Dana, Isabel, Marco and Petra huddled around Thomas. What happened? It was a unique, Dana managed through tears. It came out of nowhere. I was too slow to help him. Petra screamed into Thomas's chest, tears rolling down her face. Even Isabel's eyes were welling up. Sebastian searched the battlefield. Where's the unique now? He kept going, Marco whispered. So where's Roy? Sebastian asked. The remaining colour drained from Dana's face. Let's go. 
Dana jumped on her horse and followed Sebastian toward Wickermore. The purple wolf cried out again. Screams carried across the rooftops as the red cloaks were slaughtered. The purple flash dropped to the dirt. There's two of them, Edmund yelled. Roy had had enough of running. The white wolf charged forward. Chapter 8 Sometimes we need to lose the small battles in order to win the war. Sun Tzu Dust kicked as Roy, now the white wolf, charged. Claws launched toward the purple wolf with a powerful swipe. The purple wolf vanished as Roy's claws swiped air. Screams erupted from the hunters on the surrounding rooftops. Blood spattered as the purple wolf ripped arms and legs from bodies. It opened throats as the hunters thudded to the dirt. Too fast to track, the purple wolf was back beside Roy. He attempted to defend himself, too slow. The purple wolf tore Roy's stomach open and ripped his leg away, sending Roy into the dirt. The purple wolf pounced on top of Roy and raised its arm, ready to slash. The silver chain of the whip wrapped around the purple wolf's arm. Dana pulled the whip back, tearing the arm off. The purple wolf jumped back and stared Dana down. Sebastian drew his sword and jumped from his horse, landing deftly between Roy and the purple wolf. Every hunter left breathing. Defend the white wolf, Edmund boomed. Zoe and the other hunters remaining joined Sebastian. The wounded purple wolf remained where it fell. Anyone left on the rooftops, fire at the wounded wolf. A handful of silver arrows zipped in the direction of the wounded wolf. The purple wolf made a charge toward the wounded one. Dana rode to intercept. The purple wolf vanished, then appeared beside Dana's horse. The horse screamed and threw Dana as claws ripped along the length of its side. Dana looked on from the dirt as the purple wolf scooped up the wounded one. A second volley of arrows fired at the pair and hit the dirt. The purple wolf was already exiting the village. Grab the injured, Edmund commanded. If the wolf struck them, you know what needs to be done. We make way for the convoy in five minutes. Sebastian helped Dana from the ground. How is he? Dana asked. Not great, but he'll live. Sebastian replied. Roy was still in wolf form as Dana made her way to her brother. The wounds in his stomach had already healed. The bleeding from the stump of his severed leg had slowed to a trickle. More amazingly, there were signs the leg was growing back. Of the 300 hunters that made the trip to Wickermore, less than 100 remained. Roy slept in the rear of a wagon as his body continued to repair itself. Edmund rode at the front of the convoy, Zoe by his side. We lost a lot of good soldiers for nothing today, Edmund, Zoe said. The cost was heavy, Edmund replied, but I don't see it being for nothing. Zoe shot her commander a sideways glance, but held her tongue. Before today, we didn't know for certain what the unique's intentions were. Edmund met Zoe's eyes. We now know that they're after Roy. There are other logical inferences that we can draw as well. Such as? Zoe asked. While Roy clearly means us no harm, the others clearly do. Zoe snorted. What was your first clue? You misunderstand, Zoe. I think to some degree, Lisa Irving's accusations were correct. She just accused the wrong person. I've long feared the uniques are living among us, changing at will, the same as Roy Barrett. I believe they've stopped wiping us out until they eliminate Roy. 
Sally glanced back toward the wagon carrying Roy. They came pretty close today. Yes, Edmund whispered. That blame falls on me. I suspected there may be more than the Black Alpha and the Crocodile Wolf. I failed to account for the speed of the new wolves or the fact there were two of them. Well, that was sobering, Sebastian muttered as he rode beside the other captains. What was? Hector asked. Did you expect the wolves to stand still and let us win? Sebastian laughed. Of course not. I'm not talking about the wolves. I'm talking about the fact the commander used us all as expendable bait. Huh? Hector was caught off guard. Sebastian now also had the attention of Mindy and Daniel. While the commander engaged the unique in Wickermore, we're all dying in the field like we're supposed to be. Sebastian stared the others down. He knew the unique was after Roy and would chase him. He was happy for all of us to die to get the unique right where he wanted it to be. Or am I the only one who wasn't in on the joke? Shut your mouth, Daniel exploded. The commander would never do that to us. Keep talking like that and I'll cut your tongue out. Mindy laughed. Easy, Daniel. He's right. What? Daniel turned on Mindy. Think about it. Mindy paused. Disregard. That's not your strong suit. I think the commander figured out the other uniques are like Roy. That's why he didn't tell us. Can someone tell me what's going on? Hector asked. Sebastian sighed. Roy has been living here among us all since he was born. And? If Roy's been with us for that long, wouldn't it make sense that the other uniques have been doing the same? Hector and Daniel's faces remained confused. Mindy grew frustrated. The other uniques are living among us, and have been for years. The commander didn't let us in on the plan because any of us could be wolves. Mindy laughed. What's so funny? Hector asked. I'm just happy Sebastian is here. Before this mission, I received more intelligent conversation from baked potatoes than I did other captains. Dana rode away from the others, lost in her own thoughts. The bracelet the children made for Thomas sat on her wrist, beside the one they'd made for her. She stared with contempt at the commander at the front of the convoy. The entire mission had left Dana with an unpleasant taste in her mouth and the knowledge they were all very expendable. Edmund's plan to rescue them at the trial no longer felt like a noble act. It was the exchange of one death sentence for another. Today it was Thomas. Who will it be tomorrow? Dana's thoughts drifted through all the encounters she'd witnessed. Every battle, every life lost. The time she thought she'd failed her father and lost Roy. Her eyes grew wide with the next thought. It can't be. Dana rode her horse toward Commander Williams. The gates of the Hunter Barracks opened to far less fanfare to when they departed. Other than the remaining Hunter platoon, the only others there to greet them were Henry and Susan. Dana watched on as Petra, still in tears, knelt in front of them. Henry and Susan's screams broke the solemn silence of the barracks. Dana's eyes found Marco and Isabel standing awkwardly behind Petra. Looks of helplessness on the faces of both. Am I broken? Dana wondered. Susan broke free of Petra's embrace and sprinted toward the barracks gates. Dana jumped from her horse and caught the girl. It's not true! Susan screamed. He's not dead! I have to go and save him! Susan struggled in Dana's arms before relenting and burying her sobbing face into Dana's shoulder. Susan felt the weight on her wrist. Through tears, she looked down at the bracelet she'd made for Thomas. A group of five white cloaks rode into the barracks. Samuel and Dane Morris were among them. They looked away when Dana glanced up. Still feeling guilty about Elmwood, boys? Dana wondered. Commander Williams, Dane called. Edmund strode forward. What is it? Commander Irving is on her way here now with an arrest warrant. For what? Panic spread across Dane's face. She knows the mission failed. Commander Irving intends to force General Gordon to keep his word and force you to answer for the hunter casualties resulting from the mission using Roy Barrett. Edmund smiled. 
What's so funny about this? Zoe asked. It's a shame Roy stopped that wolf from killing her during his trial. How long before she gets here? Edmund asked. Dane shrugged. Minutes? Maybe? Edmund met Dana's eyes. She understood. Roy was still unconscious in the back of the wagon. Dana found Samuel and Dane. You two need to help me now. What? They asked in unison. Irvin is coming for Commander Williams this time. How long before she comes for Roy again? I have to get him out of here while I can. Why do you need our help? Samuel asked. Dana shook her head. Because anyone caught helping us stands to share the noose with us. Both boys couldn't mask their apprehension. I thought, since you left us to die in Elmwood, maybe you'd like to make things right. The brothers turned to look at each other before turning back to Dana. What do you need us to do? Dana asked. Help me get Roy into the stables. Three hundred blue cloaks led by Lisa Irving entered the hunter barracks on horseback. Edmund stepped forward to greet them. To what do we owe the honour of this visit, Commander? Commander Edmund Williams, you are hereby under arrest, Lisa responded. For what crime? Edmund asked. Lisa smiled. Your own hubris, Edmund. You accepted responsibility for casualties sustained in battle using your new toy. Her eyes searched the battle-weary faces. Where is Roy Barrett? I have a warrant for him as well. The boy may not have killed two-thirds of your soldiers himself, but neither you nor he prevented them from needless death. Lisa's face hardened. Where is your dog, Edmund? He's not your enemy, Lisa, and neither am I. He glared up at Lisa. How do you know how the mission fared already? Dane kept watch on the door of the stables, while Samuel and Dana covered Roy with hay. Lisa ordered her troops to search the barracks. You don't have long, Dana. He turned to face her. How are you planning on getting out of here anyway? How did you two get out of Elmwood? Dana asked. Samuel stopped shoveling hay and exchanged a glance with Dane. We barely escaped, Dane replied. We both got lucky. Hmm, maybe, Dana replied. Why did you watch our trial? I understand that a lot of people did, but why you two? We haven't got time for this, Samuel muttered. Dane's eyes watched Dana intently. We were worried about you. Mm, that also makes sense, Dana replied, still shoveling hay. I noticed you were there to see us off on this mission too. Dana drove the tip of the shovel into the dirt and leant on it. There's just one thing that bothers me. What's that, Dana asked. Hours earlier. Dana rode up alongside Edmund and Zoe. What is it, Sterling? Dana hesitated. If you're here to lecture us on the mission, save your breath, Zoe said. Uh, no, it's not that, Dana replied. I, I just remembered something. Back in the stables. Which one of you killed Thomas? Dana asked. Dane smiled. How long have you been onto us? I didn't know for sure until right this second. Makes sense, Dana replied. But why were you suspicious? Dana spoke as her hand drifted toward the whip on her belt. I knocked my head pretty good at Elmwood. My memories of the whole thing are pretty foggy. On the trip back to the barracks, I remembered something. You didn't escape Elmwood. The wolves that had us surrounded let you leave. Dane laughed. I must admit, when I found out you survived... I did wonder if you saw that. His face hardened. So what's your plan now? Seems pretty reckless to share your suspicions in here alone with us. I figured it was my best chance to get the answer to my question. So, which one of you killed Thomas? Dane's voice deepened as his eyes flashed. I did. With a short sword in each hand, Zoe dropped from the rafters. Dane! Samuel screamed. He knocked his brother clear as the sword slashed. Dane, fully transformed, looked on in horror as Samuel's head thudded to the dirt. Dana flashed her whip. Dane's powerful purple claw caught it. 
With a flash, she tossed Dana through the door of the barn into the dirt outside. Dane charged at Zoe. She dove forward without time to think, passing beneath him, and sprinted from the stable to the barracks courtyard. Here it comes, Zoe screamed. All she could do now was hope Edmund had been able to talk reason into Lisa Irving. The purple blur flashed through the stable doors. Zoe dropped to the dirt. Fire! Edmund boomed. The silver net shot from the catapult across the yard. It wrapped around Dane and brought him to the ground. He tried to struggle free, but the silver drained him. The purple wolf melted away, leaving only Dane. Zoe stood over him. Your brother won't be coming to save you this time. They burnt Samuel's body on a pyre in the courtyard, while the interior guard locked Dane away in a cell capable of holding him. You do like to take risks, don't you, Edmund? Lisa said. Edmund smiled. I'm not your rival, Lisa. I was proving you right. How so? You were right when you suggested we had foxes in our henhouse. He met her eyes. You just accused the wrong fox. Lisa nodded. She strode to the pyre burning Samuel's body and tossed the arrest warrants into the flames. What hope do we have, Edmund? More than we had yesterday. We know the Uniques are among us and probably have been for years. We've taken one out and have another in custody. With any luck, interrogations of Dane Morris will provide us with more information right now than we've gained in the past decade. He held his hand out to Lisa. I think if we start working together, we have more hope now than we've ever had. Lisa took Edmund's hand firmly and shook. Roy came to a few hours later. He didn't know how to react as he was told about Thomas's death and the further revelation that two men he'd known since childhood were responsible for that death and many more. Dana remained quiet while Sebastian filled him in, lost in her own thoughts. She left Roy with Sebastian, Marco, Isabel and Petra. The cool evening air was refreshing as it kissed her face. A solitary tear rolled down her cheek. Knowledge is both powerful and lonely. The day had proven to her that the war was far from over and it was far closer to their doorstep than anyone ever realised. No longer was the enemy miles away. If Samuel and Dane who'd trained and fought with her for years, shared meals with her, could be the enemy. Then nowhere was safe. If you like what you heard, please like and share the video, and please subscribe to the channel. Remember, the dark plays tricks with our mind, but sometimes it isn't a trick. Sometimes there really is something there.